Hi everybody, I'm Michelle Carpenter and welcome to Keeping It Real. I'm so excited today to have Sue Tobin with us and to be honest, I haven't had any interviews in the last few months. I was parking Keeping It Real and just bringing myself towards myself and trying to decide what my next part of my journey is. And let me tell you, this journey has been nothing short of miraculous. And Sue Tobin, who is here today to talk about her incredible book that has just been launched, has been very much a part of my journey. Sue, welcome to Keeping It Real. I'm so, so honored to have you here with me today. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. I'm honored too. So please tell us about this, this work of art, this body of work, this, oh my gosh, like sweet guts, I think lack of sleep, uh, I think you name it, changing, disappearing, like everything happened with this beautiful book. First of all, tell us, tell us the name of your book, please. It's Grief, Sufferings and Transitions. Um, and then it has another little title underneath of what it's really about. And that's the awareness, growth and transformations. So it's about our sufferings and how we can re release ourselves from these sufferings of life, which we all suffer, you know, because if you're rich, you will suffer. It might be nice to have money, but, you know, some people are quite lonely when they've got money because they don't know who to trust. So they have their own sufferings. Mm -hmm. And through Paul, we've got the opposite side. And if we're in the middle, we have a, our own emotions, which we're always suffering with. Have I done this right? Have I done that right? Why did they do that to me? Why did? When really it's all about the sufferings are for us. They're not done to us because it's a learning. And if you could see the learnings within these sufferings, then you can move forward in life. You know, you start working with your own fears. What is fear? So it's, it's basically the book is about helping yourselves and helping yourselves, I hope, through what I've learned, because I've had to help myself. And I found these tools that really work. So, yes, it's to help everybody. So please share with us how this book came into fruition and into um into the physical world, like I say, and no jokes, guys, Sue has, gosh, been such an inspiration uh, in learning and hearing what she has gone through because it's kind of like you've gone <laughs> and <laughs> excuse us, oh. but that's what it feels like. <laughs> and I'm not even you, <laughs> but <clears throat> excuse me, it just, you really have walked a journey. I mean, you started writing this book when? Last year, 2023? Um, I was asked to write it in August 23. And when, now you're talking to someone who can't write books or couldn't write books or didn't know anything much about English. It was my worst subject in school. In fact, I was told when I was four, um, because my brain is on the wrong side because I'm left-handed I couldn't read the flashcards going out to play and if you didn't go out to play you couldn't have your bottle of milk and you couldn't go out to play and so this teacher said you know you, you can't help it your brain's on the wrong side so you know um, on the other hand she it was a punishment to keep me in perhaps to try and encourage me to try and learn but no one had taught me. So in one way, it was it was good. In one way, it was bad. I mean, the good side is I wouldn't have to play with the bullies. I could avoid them. I could be indoors. I wouldn't get wet. <laughs> so there were good parts, you know, to it as well. So throughout my life, I thought I really wasn't good at English. And every time it was reading out loud in class, whether it was seven, whether it was 12 or 15, I hated it. I hated exposing myself because I just couldn't get it together. And I hated English. Um, so I was really surprised, <laughs> to say the least, uh, in August last year when I met the Ascended Masters Council of Eight. 
after speaking to them previously and they wanted me to go to this island and there was an experience there. So I came back and spoke to them and they said, oh, all good, all good. We applaud you, we applaud you. Now it's time to write your book. My book? <laughs> write? <laughs> yes, write the book. And um, I did the first part was 58,000 words in just under six weeks, which was just, what happened? <laughs> I couldn't stop typing. I couldn't stop typing. I was just going. So it was, it was obviously being downloaded. I was getting help. Um, but I had to write everything that had happened to me. And I was told every emotion, every experience, um, how you got out from these situations, um, how you dealt with life. And what you've learned from it. And the reason is because there are tools there where we can move forward. So that was the beginning. And then it's been um, a little journey kind of going all the way through till this year where um, sometimes you don't pick the right publisher or editors or whatever. And then I found the right publisher and editor recently, which was wonderful. Uh, my book went up to, I think, about 75,000 words. It could be 76 by now. Um, and that was great. But then <clears throat> the Council of Eight, excuse me, <coughs> um, wanted to meet up and said, so the book, yes, it needs editing. I needed a publisher. Yes, we got an editor and we got a publisher now. So you have just under three weeks to get it published <laughs> right <laughs> yeah no pressure oh my god <laughs> like really guys you know we live in time here <laughs> happened before but i know you know the publisher and, and the editor are going what <laughs> um so we as a team worked together and we worked really hard working all times throughout the night and then got it out on time for the 26th well, of September. Sue, you're making it sound really easy and simple in, in the way you are sharing this. But if I may, um, you know, you went through, was it two publishers, if I'm not mistaken, or was it the third one that you aligned with? Uh, we went through, no, just the one. Um, oh. And that didn't work out very well. So there was, oh, beg your pardon, there was a second editor that was very kind but we didn't have a publisher and that was more difficult then because the connections weren't there. And she was very, very kind, um, hadn't started the editing. And after um, a month or so, I explained that I'd found two that were very in line with the work. And, and she was delighted because she was really trying to help me out. So it all worked out really well. Yeah. And yeah. the beauty of, of honestly, guys, the, the, the amazing essence, the truth of what Sue has shared in her words is, I haven't read the book yet because it only came out last week, um, is that it's you wanted the words, your, your, your knowledge to be in every word. And um, the last publisher, who is an incredible human being, um, she, you know, I said to her, can I please introduce the two of you? And she just said, like, we were voice messing each other. And she's like, after she met you, she's like, oh, my God, Michelle. Oh, my, oh, like, she was just absolutely, like, on the same train. And that's where she, she I want to say, upheld and knew what this journey was about for you. And um, you all did, from the editor to the publisher to Sue, you just pulled it together in the most miraculous way and everybody learned and I know that that's what you have taught me over time is that there's there's a gift there's a lesson there's a learning and sometimes you know I still come kicking and screaming with the lessons <laughs> really <laughs> yeah. what? um but share a little bit about what your your journey has been about from when you were eight years old with your mother and what your mother has taught you and and then share a little bit about the depth of the book and who you are and then I'll show people a photo of the front cover because it's like ding, people people it will just align 
Thank you. Well, it all started when I was um, about eight years of age. I do remember, though, being with my family and, and thinking when I was very young, I don't know you, but I know I've got to be here. You know, you have that kind of, who are you? <laughs> um, so when I was eight, there was an experience. My poor mum had uh, mental health problems. Um, she had psychotic moments, many of them. Um, and in those days, there wasn't a good medication. It was electric shock treatments. So my father was a beautiful person and very compassionate and would never allow that. However, um, myself and two sisters, um, uh, let's just say, experience some unpleasant times. Um, she used to live her nightmares out, so she believed in her nightmares, which were horrible for her. And we used to hear her kind of coming out in the night, walking across the floorboards, the creaky floorboards. Um, my father would be asleep. And then she'd come into, my sister and I, it was, she was four years older than me. We shared a room. She used to come into our room. And as long as we kept still, it was fine. And, but suddenly something would trigger off. She'd hear a noise or something. Perhaps it was my father getting up. And uh, she'd go hysterical. And she'd think that, you know, if my father came and tried to calm her down, that he was attacking her. So she was very fierce. So other nights she used to come and then she'd look at our eyes. So, you know, look right up, very close, about six inches away. And I remember my eyes were open one day and I thought, you're looking at these brown, crazy eyes because they were really crazy. And she couldn't help it. And I didn't, I just froze because I thought if I do anything, something's going to happen because she would panic and attack thinking I'm an attacker. And then my father would come along and just say, come on, Beth, come this way. Everything's okay, come this way. And um, so we didn't know, it'd be three or four times a week. We didn't know when she was going to walk. Sometimes we'd have a quiet sleep, but you're always on alert, waiting for her. Because um, she would violently attack. Wow. Or she's living out her nightmare. Not that she was a vicious person. She just thought we were all people that were going to attack her so we had to be really quiet and then in the daytime she'd have psychotic moments she'd, she'd go into total anxiety you know if I fell over or something it, she just couldn't cope with it and then you get a <laughs> um, and yes it, um, what happened when I was eight it was in the daytime and um, I'd ripped my trousers I'd fallen I think it was off the bike and it was just many, you you could knock over a glass or something, it would set her off. So I had a Sheltie sheepdog and he was, you know, as terrified as I was. <laughs> and he used to run with me into the back garden. Let's go, let's go, let's go and hide under the bushes as she chased us. Um, but this time we went under the dining room table and we were watching her legs going past the dining room table. Very, very and my dog would be shaking. And then she'd be calling my name, um, trying to find me. And she'd be making pastry. So she had this. <laughs> this pastry roller in her hand the wooden ones and um, when the coast was clear the two of us ran out into the back garden then and then she heard us and came out after us and we were running it's only a small garden it was a little semi, semi with um, a kind of lean to at the back so we ran through there ran out into the garden and then um, she came after me and something very strange started to happen as I'm running to the back gate my dog has run under the bushes where I'm supposed to be. And he's kind of looking at me. What are you doing? What are you doing? And I'm looking at the back gate and I've, I just had this very strange, funny feeling going through my body. Like static. And I stopped. And I turned around and looked at her. And it was like looking at a movie, a slow motion movie as she's coming towards me with her rolling pin. And... It's like I was in the eye of a hurricane, in the peace and quiet and the calm. And I see this other world seeing her coming towards me. And all I could see was a totally different person as seeing the love and the compassion in her. This wasn't her. 
this wasn't her. There was something else going on with her. And then I had an understanding of what was going on. And as she came towards me, she started to slow down, which was really unusual. And then she gave up as if I've given up, I've given up and just turned away and walked off back into the kitchen. My dog looked at me and I looked at him. <laughs> and um, I was just in that moment, I don't know for how long, and then I came back into the child again and um, went to see my little dog and, and gave him a hug. He was still, his little legs were shaking like crazy. And I said, listen, come on, we'll go back in. Well, it's all okay now. Wow. And it was really what I call now um, a moment of awareness. When you really see the person, what we really are, who we really are. We're wearing cloaks of different roles, you know, being the housewife, being the uh, the husband, the worker, um, the priest. Um, you know, we just got different roles in life, the friend, and we wear several a day. So it's getting to know who you really are beneath those cloaks. And that's what I think I saw in my mother, who she really was. She was in this, this terrible situation of mental health. So from there on, I could understand her more. And she still carried on with the nightmares. She had help with medication when she was in, probably in her 40s, but not for the nightmares at night. Nobody knew about this. Um, and it was a terrible life for her. So yes, that was, that was the start of my journey. And um, eventually it just progressed that I was older, got married, two children. And then we moved abroad, um, came back, moved abroad, came back for my husband's job. Um, following that, after 24 years, um, there was a divorce. My husband decided to have another life. And, um, you know, these are all learnings of acceptance. You know, if we can learn to accept without the anger, without the, why me? Why are these things happening to me? They don't. They happen for you. They happen for you. Because there's a gift out there. There's a, you know, there's a change. You know, there's, it's what we call the impermanence of life. It's forever changing. And you can't change that. So you might as well accept it and move forward with your new life and what it can offer. And what it offered me was that um, I used to, I tried to practice meditation. I was about 16 um, when I was, I found there was a monk opposite this lovely church in our hometown, but it was my mother's church. So of course I couldn't stay there because his life would be hell. <laughs> it would have been absolutely um, devastating for him if she found out that I was with a cult because <laughs> that's how she would look at it. Um, so I stopped and then I started again after the divorce. I joined a group. I had two teenagers that were going to do their A-levels and GCSEs. So I had to look for work. I wasn't qualified. I didn't have any money. And um, so I ended up with three jobs. Uh, one was working as a carer with social services. I was a reflexologist. So I worked two evenings there and I eventually became a palliative nurse, which I absolutely adored, absolutely adored. I knew where I was to be now, but it meant working for three years about, um, it went up to 80 hours a week and then I had to bring it back to 70 because it was far too much, but we just had to live. Um, and then after that, um, I met this group, which I said, you know, I joined for meditation and they said, oh, in six months time, we're going to the Himalayas to take um, goods and clothes and pens to Tibetan refugees. Come with us. And I said, oh, my God, that that would be my dream. I mean, that that would be beautiful. I've always wondered what India was like. I always loved looking at the Himalayas. And uh, I said, not this time, because, you know, I can't afford it. And um, 
So about six or eight weeks before they went, we were going into class and and they presented me with a collection they had made for me to actually take a flight out with them, a return flight, of course. <laughs> I think I could have stayed there actually, but never mind. <laughs> um, and they they said, you must come with us. And one half of me saying, they shouldn't be doing this. But the other half says, I think I need to go. I think I really need to go there for some reason. And that was my journey, meeting Tibetan lamas, teachers. Uh, eventually, His Holiness Sakya Trizin was one of the, but they, although he is a teacher of the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama is teaching him. So they exchange their teachings together because one is the um, embodiment of uh, compassion, that's his holiness, and uh, Sakya and embodiment of wisdom. So they share what they know throughout their lineage. Mm. Um, and I was fortunate to take initiations with his holiness, uh, Sakya in, and it just developed from there. It just escalated that with my palliative experience as a nurse, I worked a lot in India, um, with people who were dying, uh, sometimes in the Himalayas, sometimes in the south. Mid-India was working with the lepers. Um, and then eventually, I was a nurse, palliative nurse for 22 years, but I was still in my leave time flying out to India, you know, working with these people. And I'd pay for my own flight and I just so enjoyed it. Um, and I thought, what? What's one year of my life? I could just take a year out from the NHS and um, just go and work abroad for one year with palliative care. So eventually I found this company and uh, it was in Thailand. Um, and I was going to work with a team in the forest with uh, people who had full blown AIDS. And I thought that sounds brilliant. But when I got to Thailand, there was a political problem and I couldn't do it. So they found a place two weeks later, um, similar. <laughs> it was in a jungle and it was uh, with 27 patients I had first. Um, Can I just stop all... you? Can I just stop yes. you before you continue? Because this, I could just listen to you and listen to you and listen. I'm sure everybody else feels the same, but th these the knowing how how were you just guided in the essence of your of you because just listening to your story going back to you being a young girl a teenager having three jobs so did you put yourself through through college or university to become a palliative nurse like I couldn't afford it to do that you needed uh, seven to eight thousand pounds and I didn't have anything so mm -hmm. I had uh, in-house training so you mean you you you're trained as a palliative nurse. Um, it does mean that you pay the forfeit of you can't be called qualified um, because you didn't have a degree. So it meant a lower wage. Um, and that was okay. I could still kind of work with the palliative and, um, you know, do my best for them and their families. So, yes, it's, it's a different path because sometimes you just can't afford to go to a university. I would have loved to have done. Wow. But it's absolutely totally impossible for me to do it. And I had two children, you know. You can't work 70 hours and study and have that amount of money when you're on your own unless you're really fortunate. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes, that's how it all developed. So the knowing is like once you've had that awareness, um you can see a lot more in the way that the way people are responding to their sufferings and who they are and how they project and how you just have an insight of what's going on with people. And it that's all developed, you know, it all develops as you're you're getting older. And that's why you could work I could work with dying people. You know, it's a total privilege to work for people who are dying because actually in your last couple of days, you actually see who you really are. You're not wearing the cloaks anymore. It's who you really are. 
And so all these little insights were coming to me. And, um, and that's what happened. So I lived in the jungle uh, on my own. There was no team. And they explained that it was eight miles inside of the jungle and they're all full-blown AIDS uh, patients. Um, the only problem is there's no medication. So these poor people um, had a, a tough time and those street people. So, you know, they couldn't afford probably. I don't know the real answer on that because I couldn't speak their language enough. I had to learn a little bit when I was in there with them. Um, so I didn't know. All I knew, there were street people. They had no money. They, they were put in the jungle. Um, and there was a caretaker. So there was someone that came into the jungle uh, every day, but for a couple of hours and then drive off again just to make sure that I was okay and everybody else was still there or if anybody had died, do they need a truck, you know, where they could take um, their deceased off to the monastery, which was eight kilometers away. That's, um, I think, gave them the ground to to live there. <clears throat> um, so, yes, it was it's quite an experience, really, because um, with three people, you have prostitutes, thieves, ex drug addicts, um, murderers. Um, mixture of people who were desperate, who had been desperate to get food. Now, I don't say that it's, it's a good thing to do, um, but what would we do if we didn't have any money uh, for our children? What would we do? There was no social services, no backing from, you know, because not all governments can afford this. Uh, all countries are different. Yeah. What would we do? Would we steal? I love what you're saying because being South African, you know, there is, there's the, the rich, there's the middle class and there's the very poor. And mm -hmm. my husband and I used to say the same is that if we needed to feed our family, what would we do? You know, would we steal bread? Would we, yes, the violent crime is, but I think that the violence becomes something that it's just this, 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 this inside burning desire to not want to hurt, but you're hurting inside of you. So it's almost like you want to put that hurt onto others. Did you find that with you being in the jungle? Was there any ever um, projection? Because if you, if you look at it, like where my head's going is we know that there's cycles of abuse in, 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 in our lineages, okay? So so you had chosen your mother as a soul, your father as a soul, who sounds like a very gentle man. Um, and what was your what was your marriage like? Was there any cycles of abuse that if if I don't know if this is too much of a personal question, but was there was that was what you saw in your mom at that time is what you saw in your ex husband, um, or were there were there patterns that were repeating themselves out too? I think that um you know, we had a, a had a good life. You know, he was my boyfriend that lived in the next town in Wales. You know, and uh, so we were young and got married and had children, and the children had a good life as well. And that it was quite devastating for them to find out that you know he was leaving. Um, but sometimes in in life, if our path's going to change, it will change, and that's the way it is. Mm. You know, why? try and grab onto something and cause more suffering for yourself when it's going to happen anyway. And that's that's what I, sorry to interrupt you. That's what I love with you saying this because so many of us, myself included, have thought that the suffering, living in the suffering is okay due to those family patterns, due to those what we've, what we've been in, what we've been conditioned to be like. You know, and I think that marriage is one of those things where it's we've been institutionalized and we've been led to believe that you've got to stay in it. You've got, but like you said, it's this happens for us, and you feel safe. You feel yeah. safe in a marriage and in the environment with children and family, yeah. and it can be great. You know, but people change. We all change. And we either go with the change or we don't. And so it is a big learning of acceptance. And also you've got to step into the fear. We're all in fear. Why are we in fear? You know, so it's these are tools that are in the book. 
of how I stepped into the fear, how I accepted. And I'm not perfect, you know, I'm still learning. Um, but knowing, having this knowing of how, how to deal with life is a sheer gift in themselves. Just, mm -hmm. you know, because if we go into the sufferings and it's all done to you, then you're punishing yourself in one way. You know, you're accepting this is the way my life has to be. Does it? You know, does it have to be like this? Mm -hmm. There are other paths. Mm -hmm. But that's scary because if you step out of that path, you don't have any money, you don't have support, you don't have anything. It causes confusion and more suffering. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, when you're put in that position, um, you have to do it anyway. I mean, I found it very hard getting jobs. I even asked a well-known supermarket, you know, anybody. To, and they turned me down and said, other jobs are more suitable for you. And it's just like, what? <laughs> what jobs? You know, and you're desperate looking for work. Is this after you had gone through your divorce? That And, uh, okay. Wow. Immediately looking for work because I wasn't trained in anything because I'd been a mother. And, um, wow. you know, so the only thing I had was reflexology, which was great, but, and that was twice a week and I loved it, but it's not um, a reliable income. You know, people get sick and can't come to you or they cancel or this, that and the other. So, you know, the wages are really little. By the time you played the clinic or renting the room out, it was very little. Mm -hmm. And so I had to find more jobs. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I was just, you know, fortunate or is it the way your life should go anyway? You know, and, and you're getting to know, when you're put in these positions, you're getting to know who you are as well, who you are inside. You know, okay, I'm the nurse, I'm the carer, I'm the reflexologist or, um, you know, again, more cloaks. But you have to learn who you are inside. And what I learned through these tools, through life, through the sufferings, is very, very deep compassion. And that is so important to give to people, to help people, but without the attachment of, I must help that person, I must help that person. Oh, and there's another one. There's another one that needs help. So it's not, it's not that way. It's not that direction. It's being with people in the present time. And yes, we all know about the present time. We've heard about the present time and people could saying about being the now and Eckhart Tolle is brilliant at what he does. But what I discovered in the jungle, how important the pause was, just pausing, just keeping still for a moment because sometimes the ego goes, fight or flight, go now, dangerous. And I, I didn't. And I think if I had gone in that situation, I may not be here today. So what it was teaching me, the pause, is keep doing this. Because one pause, two pauses, three pauses, eventually will get you into the now. So it's a slow learning process, but absolutely fabulous because it's a gift yes and that comes with wisdom and it's so fascinating because it's, it's I can see how you were being prepared the universe God source was preparing you at the age of eight for clearly what you already knew to be a truth um, yet my head my ego is kind of kicking in and going how do you learn that? Like how, like, was it through life experiences? Was Because it's so easy to go into that fight, flight, fright response. And the one thing I want to ask you, are there boundaries in compassion? Oh, yeah. Well, as long as there anything like an attachment um, is not good for you or an aversion. So you, if you overdo things, do too much of it or... Um, Wherever you go, let me do this for you. Let me do that for you. Um, people don't want you doing that. You know, you get too much. And mm -hmm. so anything that's over the top or becomes like, I must, I must, I should. 
is not in my vocabulary. Mm. It's kind of being there with the person. It's having really good listening skills. Listen to what they're saying, not to what your mind, your thought is saying, what do I say next? Mm. Mm. So you're being very present and you're taking in what these people are saying. Mm. You're absorbing it and you're being in their place and you know where they're coming from and you're listening. Listening skills are really, really important. Um, so, yes, it's it's the whole process has been a learning experience. Um, and it, it's facing your fears, you know, and, and with the awareness, because when you start doing all this work, then you start to become more aware, which is what we want to do, because when we're more aware, we're in the pause, we're in another pause, we're in another pause, and you're in the now, so it continues on. And um, a little example. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but it happened three times. Um, I'm driving along with someone in the car. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to take some water <laughs> when yeah. I can find it. Um, yeah, sorry. So when um, we're driving along the car, with another person that's driving and um it happened with me the, let's go to the monasteries when i was learning to actually take robes be in robes be a nun that was for another reason another story um the abbot was going to a funeral and he asked me to go along with him and we had a driver in a four by four who offered to take us so it was a couple of hours away and this was in Bangkok, so we went to the funeral and we were coming back through these country lanes. And they're quite narrow little country lanes and there was quite a high hedge and there were some builders behind it. Um, we didn't know this at the time, but suddenly I saw this like large girder coming, you know, um, it was a very large piece of steel, heavy steel coming over the hedge. And... The driver didn't see it, and Long Paul was sitting in the back, and um, he wouldn't have seen it. But for that moment, and I mean moment, this crane had dropped this girder down by accident into the lane. And so that moment of it's facing our car level, yeah. I took the wheel and put it into the hedge wow. and just brought it away from and it missed us by centimeters. And then there was like, it's almost like the builders realized, oh my God, it's gone over the head and they're getting it up. And, you know, um, and that I've done three times with people who are driving, just that moment of, let's take the wheel. And that's the pause, that's the awareness. It doesn't mean to say it's going to happen all the time. But sometimes I'm really grateful that it does happen. <laughs> you, do, you do it that calmly. That's what I want to know. Like, let's just take <laughs> me. I'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> that's it. But you've missed the pause then. Yes, but but that's I'm you on a panic in fight or flight. That's gone into your car. Yes, but d does that not sometimes save people? Like I've had moments where, um, like where my husband's driving along and I will see something which maybe is the pause. I will see the fact that they're breaking and my, you know, I, there's so many questions I want to ask you. So let me just come back. But in the moments, you know, I've seen that people are breaking and I'd say to him, bun break. But in his head, he's heard me go, buddy, break, <laughs> you know, so it's quite fascinating because then we would perhaps even break out in an argument and you'd say, don't do that to me. And I'd say, I didn't do anything to you. I'm just, I saw that they were breaking and you weren't breaking. So, <laughs> so the pause, whatever the pause was in that moment just became like, Oh, okay. We get confetti. But I, I don't know if I'm explaining myself because sometimes he's, he's very good in that, in that pause. Whereas I might be a little bit more, you know disruptive and 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 so it, it's kind of like I love the way you say it because that that's a true master is where you just notice it like Eckhart Tolle explains it being in the now um 
but, and I want to say a big but, take us to the jungle because um, I know it's in the book, yet when you are dealing with people, beautiful human beings, and I love what you said earlier on, um, so you had a language barrier, you had no medication to give to these people. We had one box of paracetamol for a year. And 27 people, did you say? I started with 27, then it went down to 15, and then it used more people used to come in. So it changed all the time because people would die, and then we get a truck, and then they send the deceased off to the monastery where they incinerate and, and put in sacks. And there were big, huge, three big, huge hills of sacks of these poor people because nobody would claim them because of AIDS. Wow. So they were just isolated, just put in total isolation. Yeah. Um, so how did you learn to just be with them in that moment, Sue? Because like I say, I've got 500 different questions that I want to just ask you, but guys, buy the book. It's on Amazon, <laughs> okay? And um, it's it's kind of like like he has a tantalizing teaser and there's more because every time I spend time with Sue, there's so much more of her sharing. And the way she is showing up right now is is who she is. It's she's just pure grace, pure essence. I had the privilege of um being with a beautiful group last year in Egypt, and Sue was a part of our group. And it was just incredible how just observing and just, you know, when 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 you I, I, there's actually no words to describe who you are in my life, Sue, but I know how you've touched other people's lives. So to go back to the jungle, not having the language, not having medicine, for those humans that are losing loved ones in this time, what would you say to them? How do you just, you know, especially because there's so much dementia, Alzheimer's, when people are in pain, how how were you with those beautiful human beings um, in the last moments of their life? Because I know that when I worked part time for hospice in Johannesburg, you know they have that that coming back where they just like alive, and everybody goes, "I say alive." I know that they're still alive, but I'm sure you saw that many times, even being a palliative nurse, where they're kind of shifting in and out of consciousness, and then they kind of bounce back and I've seen this where you think oh my gosh there's nothing wrong with them and then they then it's kind of like they're just coming back so so can you explain that to to us um being in the jungle how did you hold space for those in the jungle by being present with them that means being with them in every moment and making them feel safe while they pass. You know, these people are left on their own to die and to look after one another. Should that happen? I wouldn't like to think that it does, but of course it does. But if it's possible that someone is with them or with you or whoever, it's it's a lonely place, you know, to go on your own. You know you've been a street person, you know you've been tough, but actually they're all in fear. And most of us are in fear before we die. Wow. We don't know what's going on. Yeah. So it's kind of reassuring them by being in that place with them and that you're you're there and be with them until they actually pass. So I'm not saying it will happen all the time. It happened in the jungle. We were hit by a typhoon and a very bad one. And um, I couldn't get to the patients. Um, I lived kind of up, up the hill slightly. And it would have been far too dangerous. I would have been killed if I'd gone outside. I'm pretty sure about that because the trees were coming down everywhere. Um, it was really dangerous. Um, but the next morning I heard from one of the mobile patients that one guy had died of a heart attack from the fright. Oh, wow. The severity of the typhoon. So you can't always be with people. and um, But if it's possible, um, I think it's really important. 
Um, and of course, I was given the, you know, I was given these instructions um, from the Ascended Masters. And um, one came to me in the jungle. And of course, I met up with the Council of Eight after that. And these masters are, are there to help us, you know. They might give us tasks to do or they may just listen to us. And I don't mean just. It's very important because they've walked our walk. They've been in this world. They've gone through karmas. They've gone through sufferings. And they are only there to help us. So if we go to them for advice or, you know, listen to them, they are full of love. They've been through all this and they became enlightened. So why don't we follow enlightened beings? To me, it makes sense. They came to me. That's that's true. But I followed what they suggested. And one set, I would call them set because actually we know that these are beings coming into one form of some sort that we would understand in essence. And I was asked to go and leave the jungle for a short while, ordain as a nun, and to encourage other monks and nuns to work with the dying. So I was given another task to do. So I had to leave for about six weeks and then return in robes. Um, so that's another story in the book. But it's, it's just full of stories, really. I've had many stories which I've had the privilege of going through, uh, difficult ones, beautiful ones. Um, so it's learning from what you've been asked to do or shown, not shy away from it. Um, you've got to go with courage. Mm. You've got to overcome fears mm. you know, and not expect people to do things for you or um, because it, it makes us weaker, you know. Sometimes we need people around us to help us and that's good. And it's, it all depends on one's needs and what you are, how you're serving them. Mm -hmm. So it's knowing that you're not giving them too many needs or making them attached to you or, you know, all these different levels of psychology, which I'm not a, an expert on. But um, I trained as a cruise counsellor and work with the Samaritans as well. And that helped, too, to make you grow in the awareness and to be with these people. Well, I was going to say, isn't the best form of psychology is being in the experience of our own learning? You know, it's yeah. it's we have that wonderful statement, um, and I'm sure all the masters, the ascended angels, all the masters that are out there are the ones that are wanting to guide us and and give to us in ways that you know they always say we have free will. But what I love is they plant seeds, and that's what psychology is about, is they plant seeds, you know, and then we have the experience of, of do, becoming the change. And even if you look at the words courage, you know, um, courage is, 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 is huge. To step into a fear takes massive courage. To step into, to even for me, when you describe the pause, it takes courage, and it takes courage to take to have self responsibility to to know your quirks to understand your um your perhaps your downfalls um as you're teaching us you know on on our beautiful connect with source mindfulness and meditation is to become the observer and right. becoming the observer is it takes courage it takes courage to go oh that's a part of me and I'm going to bring beautiful Sekhmet, which we 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 know she <laughs> she when we were in Egypt last year, she most certainly brought some some fieriness to me. I mean, I remember um, we went into her temple, then we went into the temple where there were the seven doors and um, and the seven unks, and it was such a beautiful moment because for you and me, for me specifically, because I remember one of the gentlemen taking me and putting me up against the doors. And when I, I felt myself just going into these portals, I uh, came out and when I looked, you were standing behind me. And um, and I remember just 
like, do I touch you or don't I touch you? Because you were you were just rocking. <laughs> it was so, <laughs> like Sue was out there. It was amazing. And, and then I touched you and you went, oh, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, but after I'd walked out, it was kind of like our energy, my energy, not yours, but this is what I'm learning is that how do we keep coming back into ourselves by being the observer? Because straight after being in, in Sekhmet's temple, I could feel myself being like, oh, and I, I just I heard myself just kind of saying to the group, come on, guys, come on, because, you know, everybody was, I, I think, besides yourself was feeling disruption on some level. And I know in our group, we've all got our own individual stories, but I could hear myself going, oh, that, that's not the part that I like about myself anymore. I just went into the sergeant major mode. And and then I walked up to somebody else in our group and I said, I'm so sorry, because she was like in, she was in my vibration, you know, of just like, come, 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 come on, guys, come on, we need to get it together. Like I became like this taskmaster. And I, I could hear myself saying, no, Michelle, no, that's that's what you're working on. And I walked up to my friend and she said, no, 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 this isn't about you. It's I'm just working through something. Just give me a moment. And I thought, wow. And I didn't take it personally. And I thought, okay, I need that moment too. Take a moment, Michelle. Come back into yourself. Observe. That's the part that I don't like about myself, which is how it's, it kind of sounded like my mother's voice, but I can't blame my mother. It's just the way I was conditioned. And it's outside of myself. So I had to bring myself back. And it's a learning to take responsibility and say, Mm, okay, that's that's what we're working on. That's the part of me that I'm working on. So, so that's, go that's ahead. That's the key. Too. We have to take our responsibility, our own responsibility. Yeah. And, you know, we work with the awareness and acceptance. Um, it's very important, you know, because it frees you. It makes you free. So this is what we're aiming for, is to make our life free. In fact, enlightenment, I have been told, means free. Wow. We don't have emotions. We don't get attached to them. We don't have our needs. We don't have... Because we're always looking. We're always searching. We're always, you know, we could be moving houses. We could be just moving, 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 moving jobs. We're not satisfied. Mm. we're not free it's just being free well you know you talk about listening and, mm -hmm. and there's freedom in listening and I, I'm, I'm going to ask us to go back or you to go back to the jungle because I feel like and this is just my perception or my understanding of getting to know you is that especially because there was a language barrier is that you're listening with all of who you are not yes. just you that's sitting here you are you are tuning in you are vibrating um and and you you're tuning in to where they're at and i love yes. how you, and i'm getting such goosebumps right now because i love how you have shared with us that it is a privilege to be around those that are passing over that are passing through um you know because we go into such grief don't we in the yes. suffering that's right, and that's what we don't realize, that we're grieving nearly every day. And people don't see that because we think it's when people pass, which we do. Mm -hmm. We do go in grief, and that's good. It's good to go in grief and then learn to accept and move forward, you know, and transit because there's another life ahead. It's when we're stuck in grief, it's, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. But actually, we're grieving nearly every day. You know, we lose our bracelet, our watch, our, our iPhones, we can't ever find them again. And it's devastating. And all these thoughts and emotions come in. They're just little moments of grief. We we have them all the time. Yes. So all yes. Well, well, you've just reminded me when, especially with the cell phone, you know, I mean, just let us let a teenager lose their cell phones. It's like the end of the world. Okay. So, <laughs> and yeah. Um, and my son, you know, when he's, when he's lost, I mean, he's 14 and when, when he's lost his cell phone, I'll say to him, okay, just sit, take a few breaths, just remember, 
remember, you know where it is. Just follow your footsteps. And if you think about it, that's life, isn't it? It's following in those footsteps and of, of where we've once come from because we know what we don't want. We all know what we don't want. And that's the fear, would you say? Yes, that's the aversions and fear. Yeah. So we've got to work with everything. You know, it's there for us. We came into this world to learn. Yeah. And so we're on this journey, um, but we're terrified of learning. You know, and we start pulling ourselves back and then you put yourself in isolation in the end. Yeah. Because people don't want to be around you if you're just going to be stuck inside somewhere or yeah. um, we create you know, our own suffering sometimes. Uh, because only because we don't know how to cope with it. You know, yeah. if we have tools, you know, to help us, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. And I can only help other people by knowing what I've been through and experienced, what has happened for me, not to me. They're Amazing. not done to me. You know, they're done for you. They're learnings. Oh, one um, yeah yeah it's just moving forward with our tools that well i have discovered and i want to share it with other people because it's going to help other people you know it just relieves you from sufferings and then your awareness will grow and what else do you need on this earth you've got full awareness you have freedom i love how you say that and i'm gonna share sue's book with you guys the cover and this beautiful photo. I just want to lift this up. Tell us about this beautiful cover, Sue. Um, and can you see this? I hope everybody can see this. Oops. This is in the journal after I've ordained. Yeah. Um, we were laughing the other day, weren't we? Because when I had my head shaved, they, they cut it to about an inch. Your hair is about an inch in your head. And then, um, <coughs> let, thank you. <laughs> um, and um, the monks, it could be, it could be actually a lay person on a monk. It's always a privilege to do this for a monk or nun is actually shave their head. But we didn't have a shaver, and I suddenly, very quickly learned that a new blade was coming towards me. <laughs> no applicator, and uh, I said, "Oh, a blade!" And he said, "Oh, it is new." Um, <laughs> and so they use a blade to take all your hair off and I said oh do you ever cut many people <laughs> and he didn't he didn't I didn't have one cut he was absolutely brilliant at it It was a monk he was brilliant at it but yes they use this raw blade just to you know soap your hair all the all your head and then um, use a, a raw blade to cut it and off and it how long does it take to cut your hair like that or to have your hair cut? Um, no, I mean, I chopped a lot of it off ready for them so they didn't have a lot to do. But the actual blade cutting doesn't take, it probably takes about half an hour because they're doing it mindfully, obviously, you know, not to hurt you. But in Thailand, your eyebrows also have to go, which is not normal. I was used to the, like the Tibetan tradition. Yeah. Um but they shave your eyebrows as well. So it's all to do with letting go of who you think you are, really. I'd heard this a long time ago, so I just want to show everybody the, the cover of the book. Um, so there it is, Grief, Sufferings and Transitions, Awareness, Growth and Transformation. You guys can purchase it on Amazon. It is available on Kindle, hardcover. Um, but and that's what it's about. It's about awareness, growth and transformations but to realize that we're going through grief every day as well and how we can learn from it. Well, I think so much of the world, there it is on, on, um, on, on Amazon, guys. Um, I think so much of the world is most certainly going through this grief um, on a massive scale. And, um, you know, especially with, we know the war. I, I received a message last night from a friend saying, Michelle, what does the Council of Eight say about the war? And um, I spoke to my brother who uh, is living in Israel, but actually at the moment he's in Rwanda. And it was fascinating because he's like, oh, Shell, didn't you hear? And I was like, no, what? Um, so you know, the, the kibbutz that they live on, 
he so he's in on business in Rwanda and and he um he was lying awake the whole night because his family had been taken into their bomb shelter well the whole kibbutz had been taken into the bomb shelter it's always prepared and he said to me he said you know it's inevitable every day that you live in Israel it's a possibility that there's going to be something there's going to be an attack and I remember this from many years ago when I was I mean, he's lived in Israel, I think, for 25 odd years. I could be wrong with the with the the, the years, but you know, I remember I used to sell um, uh, chewing gums, chiclets, and uh, clorets and dentine. I used to be a sales rep for them many years ago, and we used to get free stock. And I remember standing at the airport in Johannesburg and wanting to gift him like a whole bunch for his children. He's like, "No, shall not now, not now." And I'm like, "What? What?" And he said to me. You cannot give me stuff while I'm while I'm about to check in. And I said, why? And he said to me, LL, do not allow this. I mean, this goes years back. And mm-hmm. there was such fear. And it was just such an innocent um, wanting to gift him something, you know, that that I was wanting to just, you know, that, I, that I'd had. And he said to me, no, you can't, you can't, because they, they will check me. They'll check my whole bags. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But again, there's so much of that fear, Sue, and it's been going around for such a long time. And, and why did you take the minister back? What was the reason? Because with LL, in my understandings, um, LL is such a, you know, anything to do with Israel. Oh, I is, see. You have to be so consciously aware, which I wasn't consciously aware that I couldn't even give him a bag at that time because, um, you know, they 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 on. They, they're in that space of... What happens if, what happens if, you know, I'm going into a shopping center. I remember when I went to go visit him 20 odd years ago, 19 years ago, you go into a shopping center and they open up your boot and they scan for bombs. They scan your whole um, car. Um, and it's not like the Israelis don't live, you know, but he just said you, you're always in question. You're always in the, the space of what happens if, and I said to him last night, oh, Yep, it's like living in South Africa. You know, it's like you don't want to bring the fear in, yet you are continuously living in a space of the pause or the fear, which isn't that the yin and the yang of, of life, you know? Yes, and because we're the opposite. We're, we're not so much in fear. That we have terrible fear when something happens. Yeah. The fear is exaggerated then because it's just like oh you know uh, the bomb goes off or um in fact there's there's one if i can just talk about an example you know if someone if you're walking along the road and there's a sudden car crash and you know we're caught up in thoughts all the time this is where meditation comes in so it's learning to be in the pause in meditation being in the awareness you know that you can see more, you know about yourself, but we just get clouded with more and more thoughts and get caught by ego. So you see a car crash and you're nearby and it's quite serious. So first you're shocked, I must go and help. You go to the car crash, you try and help, you do what you should do, and then you come away. Now in that those moments you're in the now because the thoughts have gone you're just kind of focusing on the car crash you're focused yeah Yeah. in that moment well you know sorry (laughs) say again all thoughts come flooding back in again you know perhaps i should have have done that or what happened to that is that that ego that perhaps i should have should have would have could have would you describe it yeah. as yeah, yeah, because you, you're kind of then beating yourself up, or what if I bring what have I done that, or perhaps I should have done this, or you know, um it's it's all ego based. You know, ego, I have to say though, ego is very helpful for us. It's not all bad. You know, I know there's a lot of talk about ego, but we need ego. We need it for fight and flight at the right time. We need it to plan. We need it, we need it. You know, it's helpful. But it's actually knowing when it's helpful to you. Well, I'm smiling. Not. I'm smiling because I don't know if this was an ego moment, but you shared with me about Babaji 
Do you remember that moment where you <laughs> where you questioned you questioned? Very rude. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's so cute. Would you like to explain to everybody? <laughs> I don't think it was rude. I think it was kind of like, you go, girlfriend. <laughs> well, not expecting, of course, in the jungle. And I'm relaxing in the evening in my robes. I know sitting on the wall outside of my room. I'm thinking again, how am I going to get more fans? How am I going to get any fans? How are we going to get, like, sometimes we just had rice per day. Not often, but it happened. Um, we had so little. We didn't have sheets. We had ripped mattresses. All things have been thrown out from a hospital. Um, rusty beds, but no sheets. One pillow that had been there 15 years, never been washed. And they were only for the dying then when the people are really dying. So you don't have a pillow, you don't have anything. What can I do? And I did apply. Um, or I had someone to help me apply to 13 different charities. Um, and um, in Britain, in Europe, everywhere. Not one replied, except for one tiny charity in Thailand that said, we're desperate too. We'd love to help you. And I'm so sorry we can't, but at least we had a reply. So I'm thinking about, you know, how, how do we do this? And all of a sudden there's um, a presence in front of me. And I get, you know, but you know, like you, you know, someone's behind you, you get the feeling you turn around, but this was in front of me. And I'm thinking, what is this? And I waited. I'm not waited. <laughs> Essence, whatever. And, and I'm thinking, now, I've been in the jungle a while now, and the humidity is very high. The jungle with the patients and street people get crazy sometimes. And sometimes I was thinking I was losing the plot, thinking, oh, they say, you know, the ghosts are here and, you know, don't whistle. You're not allowed to whistle because they're terrified. The Thai people are so terrified of ghosts. So you're not allowed to whistle. Not that I do, but you're not allowed to. Mm. And I thought it's might be a ghost that they're talking about. <laughs> so I'm thinking this essence in front of me, what I was feeling, and then the essence started talking. And uh, it was a master, you know, like of the universe, Babaji. But I didn't know that. And he said, telepathically, you are to be a nun and you are to encourage monks and nuns to help with the dying. I'm just kind of in that pause thinking, yes. Well, one, you go back into the thoughts and you say, well, how do I do this? I'm in a jungle. I'm with patients here. And who are you? Who are you to tell me that? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so... <laughs> And I was used to the Tibetan traditions and being, you know, I was thinking about being a Tibetan nun once and it didn't happen, but it was my tradition and I I loved it. You know, I loved the idea of it. And so I'm now a Thai nun and I'm in the jungle and I'm with patients. We don't have food at times and we don't have medication. And I'm desperately thinking of how we get sheets or whatever, food. And and then this essence is is come from nowhere and says, oh, you're to be a nun now. And you should help other monks and nuns work with the dying. And I said, who are you then? <laughs> Quite rude. <laughs> Silence. Speak to me. Who are you? Babaji. Oh. <laughs> I had heard of Babaji before. A good, very good friend of mine um, follows his well, his, it's not exactly his, it's the universe, you're talking to the source, the tradition uh, where they talk about um, Barbara And I used to go sometimes to Los Angeles and listen to the, their masters talking, mm -hmm. um, while my dear friend worked very hard behind the scenes, so I really enjoyed myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, so I was very aware of this name, and um, I couldn't, I just couldn't com comprehend what was going on. Barbara <laughs> And I said, something like, are you sure? You know, do you know what this means? And it was just these thoughts going through my head and it was just all telepathy. 
I need an answer again. Tell me, tell me, you know, it was like gone. That was it. That was the message. Wow. So I'm walking along up and down outside my room thinking, was that a ghost? <laughs> well, ghosts wouldn't talk like that. They don't talk, do they? Um, and I think I'm okay. I don't think I'm, I don't think it's the humidity. What on earth happened? And <laughs> I'm a Tibetan person. I want to be a Tibetan nun, you know. Why on earth would I be a Thai nun? And, why am I, and then my thoughts started changing. Actually, I think it's a good, I can feel all tingly now. Actually, mm -hmm. I think this is a good idea as I got excited. That's such a good idea. There's so many monks and nuns in Thailand that don't work with the dying because they're afraid or whatever reason. What an opportunity. If I could show them I can work as a, in robes, you know, then... I'm sorry, I wasn't in robes then because I'm getting muddled up now because I wasn't in robes. So I was, I'd been in there a couple of months. And, um, and I thought if I, could, if I could show them this, that a nun can work with the dying. And I'm thinking, but I haven't done this yet. So how can I show them this? <laughs> so all these thoughts going through your head. And eventually I just said, that's it, I'm going. This is what I'm meant to do. I've been asked to do this. And I think it's a really good idea, <laughs> being totally an ego. Um, and that's what I did. I went and got trained in Bangkok, uh, in water room, and then came back in the jungle with a carer because I had to have very strict instructions um, from the king um, of Thailand uh, because um, the Long Poor asked that we have to ask the king permission because a, man, a nun can't just go waltzing off into places where she wants to go, you know, even going down into the jungle, it's 12 hours drive away, you know, you've got to lie, you know, sleep on the floor and have a meal once a day. So he gave me a carer and made sure that would happen. Um, but when the carer got to the jungle, she said, that's it, I'm not staying in the jungle, that's it, I'm leaving you now. <laughs> um, so I learned in the, in the jungle, you know, how to work in robes with, you know, uh, the vows and... Um, and how to work with these people and, and how how beneficial it is. Because when you think about it, these people are street people. They've had no respect. And for a monk or nun in Thailand, you know, for even for a monk or nun to talk to you, they people are very humble and very, you know, respect monks and nuns. Now, for this to happen in the jungle with street people, for a nun or anybody in robes come in to help with them, it's like, do we deserve this? you know is this is this right you've done this you know um and so in one way it was a privilege for them which is good because i can help them even more now you know they're, it's more acceptable you know um and that's what i did and then um eventually went back to the monastery after i left the hospice and there's another story then when you know i eventually do get monks and nuns to work with the dying Wow. Well, Sue, I'd love to have you back. And because I think there's so much in, actually, I don't think I know that you have so much wisdom to share. And for those of you who are again watching, see, hold on. I don't know. Oops, sorry. Something just came up. Are you there, Sue? Sorry. I got a call. Sorry. That wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> um, please go and please go and buy Sue's beautiful book from Amazon and tell us what we'll you would share. <laughs> share. Thank you. Absolutely. This is a book of wonders. And if you look at my hands, it just, every single time I truly, truly know in my heart that every single time you will turn a page and read something different and read something different and Sue is an absolute master and she doesn't say it but it's it's I know it because of this journey that I've been incredibly blessed to walk with Sue um, and it's such an honor and I want to say from all of those souls that have passed over and had the privilege of having you there with them I can only imagine that and only hope and believe that you were there to hold their hands and 
that they must be incredibly, incredibly blessed from spirit to have had you with them in the jungle. And <laughs> I want to cry <laughs> because it's such a privilege, Sue. And this book, I know it's going to touch people's lives. I hope so. I hope it helps. Absolutely. But, Shall we have to learn that we're all masters underneath? For sure. And that's it. And so, then, yeah. this must be said by the book, by the book. I'm supposed to tap on a book. Tap on a book. <laughs> tap on a book. By the book, by the book. <laughs> yeah. Share the book. If you can't afford the book, share the book. Share yeah. the book. Give yeah. to others. Yeah. That's a great, and that is Sue. That is <laughs> like the one time <laughs> uh, I, I'd had Sue on in one of my previous, um, I don't even know when it was. It was like a good, I want to say a good few months ago, but probably like, a, I don't know, six to eight months ago. And, or maybe it was a session, I can't remember, but um, it was, oh, you, may, you, you wanted everybody to gift hospice. That's right, in Wales. And, um, and then we'd had a session and the Council of Aid kind of went, Sue, Sue, you got to be open. Like I'm like kind of like knocking on your hands. Like Sue, you got to be open to receiving. Like you want to give. You just and that Sue guy, she just wants to give to everybody else. And <laughs> she's like, oh, okay. It depends how you look at receive. You know, I receive. I understand that, and I'm very grateful. Receiving comes in on different levels. For so. sure. For sure. And that is yeah. what I, I, I truly would love to just get Sue's story out there, the word out there. There's so much in, again, in today's moments of time. I really feel like as a, as a global con consciousness, um, we are most certainly shifting and changing rapidly. And a lot of us are seeing and feeling the loss. A lot of us are, are knowing that grieving is a part of everyday life and you said something earlier on, which people are scared of dying. Mm -hmm. And I think that is probably one of the biggest fears that most of us have do definitely tapped into on some level. Yet there is afterlife. Mm -hmm. And, and as you said it in the masters of who we all are, we have it inside of us. When we tap into that, we know that this is the physical experience and there's more in the afterlife. The only way we can experience that is learning about the awareness and the pause, mm -hmm. the going into now, mm -hmm. because we have a, a greater insight in life. We will know, we will know who we are. Mm -hmm. I love that. So everyone, please share this beautiful, beautiful book. Um, please like and subscribe and Sue I'd love to have you back so we can talk more because there's so many stories about how monks are actually funny guys <laughs> it's not, a, not all serious stuff it's, it's, there's some quite a bit of humor in there as well you know riding on motorbikes and you know because I have no choice and they oh, I like I like you know enjoy the experience then this is what's meant to do you know um, um so yeah, it's it's fun as well. Amazing. But it's a, it is a learning as well. There's lots of little bits there, and if it help it, it helps people. That's my aim. You know these little tools, and if you practice them, and they're not difficult, they're really not difficult. Um, in fact, we're doing a meditation course, and there I try and explain how it's helped me and give situations how it's helped me. And just handing these tools over to you, really. It's a quicker pace for you. You know, I had a slow pace. <laughs> but, you know, if I can make this quicker for you and you can have the awareness and you move forward with it, I mean, that's that's what life's about, isn't it? Giving. Yeah. Sure. So Sue's talking about connect with source and um, meditation and mindfulness. And myself and the group are going into week four next week. And we are seeing incredible miracles happen within the group and we will, we will be bringing a new one 
to everyone. So just watch the space. We'll be launching it. We're just waiting for the date. Um, and we will let everybody know. And I highly, highly, highly recommend um, connecting into this beautiful meditation. So Sue, thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting us into your incredible journey. Uh, I'm, in, I'm so honored. And uh, again, please go into Amazon and just, you know, this is about the ripple effect, the ripple effect. And Sue's life work has been about the ripple effect and about giving and the ripple effect and about giving. And just by the way, did Barbara G have like big eyes, big brown eyes? I, I saw nothing. I okay. felt essence. Okay. And that's why this essence, I like to say, because I can't describe what it is. Um, I, I felt it. I felt the, the, the static. Um, but when a uh, telepathy conversation starts happening, I know it must be of some spirit of some kind. Um, and it was just, it was so short. And then my, I kept saying, well, who are you? you know, so, and he said, oh, it said Babaji. Okay. And then I, you know, the ego comes in again. As, well, who do you think you are telling me this? <laughs> But it's okay. As soon as you start re recognizing what ego is, and I'm so sorry, Babaji, <laughs> um, for being disrespectful. Um, but he was giving me a gift. You know, he was giving me a, um, something else to do that was really important where I was, what I could do. Yeah. And it's been, um, when you go into the book and the experiences of actually showing monks and nuns how to work with the dying, it's very emotional. Yeah. It's very emotional because they actually feel they actually they they walk into their own fear. <clears throat> yeah, you know. Wow. So um, thank you everyone for listening. <clears throat> and uh, excuse me, I'm going horse again. <clears throat> um, I'm truly grateful that mm. um, you're still sitting here with me and listening. <laughs> so I could have you and just listen to you for hours and hours, but. I know that um, we will have Sue back and thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us and it's never too late. It's never, ever, mm -hmm. ever too late to step into your mastery, guys. So watch this space. We'll be back soon and remember, guys, love is why we are here and it's all about the hearts. It's all about a heart-to-heart -heart connection. And when we and that source, that's the connection of who we are that I'm certainly learning on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you, Sue. I love you so, so much. And I'm very, very honored to walk this journey with you. We'll see you guys on the other side. Remember, keep it real. And uh, thank you for being here. Love you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Sue. Thank you.